Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Philip Lorea, uh, author of Minute Dot and a financial advisor, and John Cameron with the Pacific Legal Foundation and author of Rewire, Rekill, and uh, something about C. Uh, aristocracy. Aristocracy. Coming up it. late summer, early fall. There you go. Uh, welcome to the uh, two accomplished author, uh, authors and other uh, uh, accomplished gentlemen. Idaho has become uh, a, uh, the first state, I think, that has actually repealed its entire regulatory code. My understanding is they sort of did it by accident, but it's done nonetheless. Uh, and is that a good thing, bad thing, and uh, is it, will it set a precedent, do you think? And will, if it does set a precedent, will it be a good one or a bad one? Well, I think it, it, it was accidental. I'm trying to remember the facts of the case, but it isn't really a case. Uh, Apparently they couldn't they couldn't uh, get together and agree by the deadline, and so they inadvertently repealed their entire regulatory code, and and you know compared to California they don't have a regulatory code it's pretty small, but the the only way for them to to reintroduce legislate or regulations is basically by kind of an emergency process. So um, it'll be interesting to find out uh, if they, they get together and agree on, on legislative action to readopt the whole code, which they could do with, I guess, a majority, or if they, they do the brilliant thing, which would be to reintroduce uh, only those regulations that uh, are absolutely necessary. And, and Idaho's you know, pretty laissez-faire in a lot of respects anyway, a lot of respect for property rights and individual freedom, freedom of speech and all the rest of that. And, and not overwhelmed by the type of in, insane nanny state stuff we have here in California. So I think, um, uh, in answer to your first question, will it be a good thing? Abso-freaking-lutely. Good thing I said freaking, so they didn't have to flip that out. Um, in, in, in the case of regulation, less is invariably more. Uh, more for people, uh, more opportunity, more freedom, more jobs. I think the, the uh, experts, the pundits, have said that the cost of uh, regulation in the United States is, uh, depending on the study, everybody's study says over a trillion dollars annually, and that um, it could be as high as two or three, because most of the studies are government studies. So um, if, if they get out of folks' way and, and uh, let uh, uh, um, caveat emptor, you know, let the buyer beware in cases, and um, uh, I think it'll be fantastic. Will it set a precedent uh, with the um, socialism uh, being uh, the new failed cause du jour? Um, I doubt it. And then I, I say that with an asterisk, because um, an awful lot of uh, States and and you know Trump was elected basically one of his platforms that he's actually doing quite well on some of it's interesting was reduction in in uh, draining the swamp or reduction in regulation unnecessary regulation and he's been doing that uh, and um, everywhere you uh, remove unnecessary barriers to entry into trades then people have an easier time moving to the state where they already fill jobs. And some governors have actually introduced uh, legislation that, uh, that will allow uh, people from out of state to move to their state to take a job and use their previous state's licensing in order to qualify for a job in the state. And there's some, you know, some, some places where you have to go to barber college or whatever they call it for, in essence, six, seven, eight hundred hours uh, if you want to braid hair. So I think it's a fantastic thing. And, and uh, you know, if it's spun right, maybe it will uh, move into a wider arena geographically. What do you think? Good thing or bad thing? Richard? Well, no, I, I mean, it's, it's obviously a good thing. Now, the question, of course, is some regulations uh, there's a reason for. Yeah. Not too many, but a few uh, are absolutely uh, uh, justified. The question like is whether... What? Like what? Well, uh, there's a fine line between uh, statute law and regulatory law. And yeah. statute law, you know, don't kill people and don't well, yeah, take right. their stuff. 
uh, that can be some of those those kinds no, of so, laws so can those, be expressed yeah. in, in regulatory forms as well. Yeah. So those kinds of things, you, know, you have to be careful that you don't uh, throw out the baby with the bathwater. No, I, I well, I don't think the regulatory code includes uh, that's regulation. I don't think they've uh, thrown out their penal code, right? And, which is probably the, what they should throw out next and start over, <laughs> except for like. Uh, don't hurt what people, don't take their stuff. Don't, don't hurt people, don't take their stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, uh, how many words is that? Because that's, that's, that's pretty much perfect. Yeah. After that, it's, everything else is detailed. Beware. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, and, and, but you know, and the, but there are some regulatory uh, things that, 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 that essentially say that, you know, in more detail. Mm. And, you know, it's if, if, if Idaho is smart, they will say, okay, uh, if property rights are violated, for instance, by pollution, you know, mm -hmm. if my uh, runoff causes pollution on your uh, property, that would probably be a property rights violation mm -hmm. and should be covered either by, by statute law, pre preferably by statute law, but mm -hmm. certainly should be covered one way or another. Mm -hmm. So bringing those kinds of regulations uh, to, uh, back into, into existence would would make some sense if if, it's, if done correctly, mm -hmm. but most regulations are simply uh, crony capitalist mm -hmm. protections of uh, of uh, quasi monopoly or, or monopsony. So that bring, brings up a, a question. I've heard I've heard people who are claim to be uh, libertarians um, say that uh, well you know most of this regulation about uh, you know jobs and trades and training requirements is, and all the rest of that is is unnecessary but you absolutely have to have you know some kind of licensing for medical people or for somebody who works on your house or no, I forget not, what the not, third not category not at all the market will do a very good job of regulating all of that sort of thing well and and, and voluntary organizations there's a the uh, was it UPC or the the uh, there's a uh, an organization, that, uh, a regulatory organization, a, a, a private voluntary regulatory mm -hmm. Asian, uh, organization that, that governs electrical uh, standards and, yeah. and does very, very UPC nicely. UPC code yeah. and UPC. everybody lives, lives Nobody and gets dies electrocuted. by it. Nobody gets electrocuted. For some yeah. strange reason, yeah. the market actually works. People don't like to kill their customers and that, that, yeah. that applies to medicine well. as well as uh, ele electricity. There are some people who like to. I, I think you're right. I, I agree with you. And and that's the 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 problem with people who who, who <coughs> claim to be libertarians, whatever that means nowadays, and then say, well, some regulation of activity is absolutely necessary, and they say you must have it in the medical field. But then again, one of the reasons why medical costs in the in the U.S. are are double what they are in countries with uh, comparable, and some of these countries even have better health care than we do, is because our health care industry here, because of the monopoly nature of health care, um, demands and, and receives a, a very high wage compared well, to... Well, yeah, I mean, if you take a look at health care costs, the, the cost of health care went from 5% of GDP... To 18%. Uh, 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 to 18%. Yeah. And that, that, that happened between 1960 and now. Uh, and what happened that made that, made that uh, progression uh, as, as steep as it was is primarily uh, Medicare, Medi-Cal, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Obamacare, and uh, all of the rest of the regulatory mechanisms that make it really, really easy for health care providers, whether they're hospitals or doctors or uh, drug providers, pharmaceutical companies, it makes it very easy for them to charge essentially monopoly prices because mm -hmm. it restricts competition. Mm -hmm. Well, and so much of it is, you know, one of those outstanding statistics is that uh, all uh, knowledge, all training is obsolete in about five years. So anybody that goes through the whole medical training process has uh, all the, everything that they have gathered during that period is obsolete within five years which means that it's not essential at all. Uh, and I maintain that uh, there is no reason that the medical field should be any different than any other craft because that's what it is. Mm -hmm. You learn how to use a machine. You learn how to use um, uh, a blade. You know, it's no different than home construction, really. And you can learn it just as easily coming up the ranks as you can 
uh, general cr contracting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and even still we see that, for instance, nurses can do about 80% of what doctors do, but doctors won't let them do it. Uh, and there has been a big barrier conflict between those two. Pharmacists can do 80% of what nurses can do in terms of, you know, checking cholesterol and all those kinds of things, even prescribing drugs. They're more knowledgeable about it than anybody. And yet the barriers to entry, the, 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 the doctors and nurses... Yeah, it's a, it's a guild system. It goes okay. back to the medieval guilds. If, if you don't, yep. uh, if you're not born into the trade or mm -hmm. uh, go through some very, very stiff barriers, you're not going to get into the trade. It reduces the number of people that are in the trade so they're able to raise the prices for exactly. people who exactly. do pass those barriers. And it's, it's just, it's a sick system, no pun intended. <laughs> Next topic, new Trump immigration proposal. Uh, so far, the Trump administration has basically been no immigrants, but now they've actually come up with a, a proposal, an immigration proposal, that would do two things. It would restrict so-called chain immigration, which really means you don't get to uh, bring your family with you. The second thing it would do is it would say, okay, we want more highly skilled immigrants, as opposed to letting the market figure out what skills are needed for, mm. for immigration. So uh, they're defining, I'm sorry, they're actually defining what the skills are in this? Or yeah, they're, they're saying, they're saying okay, we, we, yeah, they're saying, well, they would probably defer it to a bureaucracy to say, I'm okay, we, we need, we need uh, you know, more screwdriver turners and less uh, uh, doctors or whatever, mm -hmm. looking for the specific skill sets that supposedly those on high, those uh, in the, uh, uh, in the know in government figure out that the economy needs, as opposed to the economy figuring it out for itself. Right. Philip? Uh, yeah, it, it's an interesting thing because anti-immigration seems to be the one thing that the Democrats and the Republicans agree on. Uh, you know, Obama was known as the deporter-in-chief. Uh, it was Clinton who, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, who supported the whole idea of uh, uh, the coup, uh, or rather the Supreme Court of, I believe it was Honduras, uh, throwing out the president, which they were in their constitution allowed to do, and said, you can't do that, that's our guy. And at the point when they had one of those waves like uh, we've had recently at the border, uh, you know, Clinton and Obama, no way do you let those people in. Uh, Obama there in the helicopter with Ken Perry uh, and the rifle saying, in substance, we agree. Uh, you look at California policy. I, interestingly, yeah, I... Look at uh, Jan uh, Janet Rito keep, keeping the little kid from, from Cuba from uh, uh, immigrating. You know, it has been, uh, this is something in California, we have a vested interest in keeping immigration illegal. Uh, because we have all those migrant workers. And what can you do if someone's illegal? Oh, you mean keep, it, ill keep it illegal to keep the cost of labor down. Exactly, yeah. and throw them out whenever you please. Uh, and um, so, interestingly, I think that Trump came in, and uh, this is a little different take on what he said. He said, look, show me a law. This is the law, and I'm enforcing it. You don't like the law, fix it. And he said that within three months of taking office. We have had, uh, there were some 78,000 immigrants sitting right on the Mexican border, uh, which was 10 times anything that we'd had before and were equipped to deal with. And, you know, people are dying because there's just simply no way to deal with the deprivation to get to that border and get to all those people all at once. So it seems as if, and the other part of that that you mentioned, the high-skilled worker, the so-called HB1 visa, uh, right now it stands at about 400,000 people total and there is always an auction and the auction is always uh, filled within the first 24 hours. The larger issue economically, and this has been demonstrated over and over again, <laughs> is that emigration is always a positive for an economy. It doesn't replace uh, uh, the existing workers, what it does is push them up the ladder a little bit. You know, if we just think about the idea of someone speaking broken English, competing with somebody who is fluent in English in the neighborhood and such, it's ridiculous to think that those two, you know, one, the immigrant is taking the, uh, uh, the regular population's job, and that's been demonstrated. Uh, further, this country is empty. You, you get off either coastline. You get off either coastline or anywhere within 100 miles of water on, on the four borders, so to speak. This country is empty. And we have all the resources we need. What we don't have is um, a labor force. Yeah, one of the very basic economic principles is that economic growth 
Everybody is in favor of economic growth, except for a few uh, uh, Luddites, but most people are in favor of economic growth. It consists of two parts, population growth and growth and productivity. Growth and pro uh, uh, in productivity is a, is a function of technology primarily, uh, but labor force growth is impossible when you've got a lowering birth rate or a declining birth rate and mm -hmm. are preventing immigration from taking place. Japan is a really good example of what happens to an economy that prevents immigration and has a low birth rate. It stagnates. It has had, Japan has had, what, what, three lost decades now, maybe going on four. Yeah, yeah, going on four. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's just a, a basket case economy in many respects. And uh, the anti-immigrants are trying to Japanify the United States economy on immigration as well as a number of other issues. And it's, uh, you know, it's just uh, straight and simple NIMBY, not in my backyard. Uh, and it, it's, um, it's prejudice, it is wrong-headed, and actually is destructive, as, as you put it, the, the old saying is demographics is destiny. And when we, are, when we have an aging demographic and we do not have the population to, re, to replace it, as we do. And to pay taxes to support that And to pay that taxes into population. all of that, uh, that uh, that is our destiny. And we see it playing out as more and more old people require more and more of the, uh, of the national pie and fewer people are coming into the workforce uh, to supply it because, let's face it, who wants to come in and uh, give away 50% of their money? And that's what happens when you, you know, take a regular paycheck job. Yeah, but, but, millennials are afraid to have kids because they don't know how the heck they're going to be able to afford to raise them. No, well, they're sitting, on, they're sitting on top of, they've been sold a big lie about a college education. And we talk about uh, setting the high skill. I, I talked to, I think, the, I read a number couple of years ago, it's probably been 10 now because time's flying by since I'm no longer a youngster, um, that there was 100,000 machinist jobs going begging in this country because basically machinists now run a uh, multi-machine, which is basic, basically you, you program it as a computer. You don't have to be, you know, a, a computer programmer, but you have to understand how to, how to give this very smart mach uh, machine that can do so many things instructions but uh, the education system a while back we had we had at the community co college level in this country not that many years ago uh, classes in in auto and and uh, refrigeration and printing and and all the skills trades that are necessary to run the world and now those are gone with the idea that everybody needs a college education and meaning only, a liberal arts college education well and the, the people who need the college education are the administrators uh, who require constant fodder to come in so they can expand services and goods and create greater layer, layers of bureaucracy and, and uh, retire with very nice pensions. But, um, you know, I, I, I write from coffee houses and, um, you know, this brings back to the, to the, the regulatory thing we just talked about. Um, you know, in the, in the past in this country, people would travel to where the work was. But now, since just about 50% of the work anybody does requires some kind of certificate or training, and most of that is only locally recognized, if you have passed a biology board or a medical technology board and, and spent a lot of money and education on it in California and a job opens up in Colorado, your barrier to just simply move is 10 times what it was back when only 5% of the population required stuff. So um, saying we're going to set a higher skill bar is insane, you know, especially letting a government agency decide what skills are needed because there will probably be more people with uh, PhDs in sociology. Not that we have anything against sociology. No, I, I, We're I know very much in favor of socializing. Social, uh, soci what are they? Sociologists? Yeah. Las Vegas wants to become the new Amsterdam. The, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the way uh, uh, cannabis laws have been introduced and cannabis has, met, has been made legal has been very, very, um, uh, uh, how's, what's the word for it? It's, it's been hit and miss. Uh, it's been... Uh, a situation where, well, you can, in, in Nevada, for instance, you can, you can buy uh, cannabis legally. That's, that's legal. But you can't smoke it anywhere. 
you can't use it anywhere. It's illegal to be used pretty much anywhere in Las Vegas or anywhere else in Nevada other than the can't privacy use it of in your own, own home. home. Privacy, your privacy own. of your own home. Yeah. And most people who come to Las Vegas don't have, are, are not staying in the privacy of their own home. So you have this huge tourist trade coming to Las Vegas. They can buy marijuana, but they can't use it. And now uh, Las Vegas is getting smart. They're saying, okay, we'll open cannabis lounges where you can actually partake in the substance which you have purchased. Uh, is this going to, uh, it's, it's going to have two effects, right, Philip? One effect is going to be on whether people want to gamble. The other effect is... <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> yeah, when, when I get high, people want to do anything I, else. I don't want no, to no, give put new meaning to chocolate machine. chips. I guess <laughs> uh, would be the. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's a really interesting. Um, uh, you know, there are two poster children. One is California, and the other is Colorado. Uh, both Colorado legalized marijuana, made it you know essentially like any other purchase, uh, tax associated with it. You know, Colorado is a kind of a purplish state, not known to be liberal or conservative. Uh, five and a half million people, and uh, they uh, generated billions and billions of dollars in revenue. California says, uh, after, you know, real arm twisting strictly by the public, uh, there wasn't a single politician, brown on down. Uh, the police unions, the corrections officers, anybody in law enforcement wanted it to stay illegal because that's a great excuse for arresting people. And bread and butter for the unions. Uh, exactly. The cops so, unions, the prison full, unions. So Brown said, yeah, Brown said, all right, uh, if you people yeah. voted this in, I can't stop that, but what I can do is I can tax the bejesus out of it. Both at the, uh, the, from the people who actually want to sell the stuff legally to the people who want to buy it legally. And the result was that out of a population of 38 million people with this, uh, uh, draconian tax from both ends on marijuana, California managed to raise a grand total of $500 million out of 38 million Is that tax people. revenue or total revenue? Tax revenue. And here Colorado, a state in population of, you know, about a seventh of the size, a fifth of the size, uh, managed to, managed to uh, collect five times the revenue just by being fair. Mm. So you get to Las Vegas and you have all of these people who, uh, you know, the MGM and Wynn and uh, all of them saying, look, we've got this thing, we've got a captive audience. You come in this casino and we've got everything. And that's alcohol, you know, and that is, those are all of the shows, the whole thing. If they can't get on board with it, then those people who want to smoke pot and, you know, do whatever, and very likely have a, a slot machine in wherever they are, knowing Las Vegas, um, that this is a, an existential threat, actually, uh, to, the, um, to the mainstream operators in Las Vegas and could literally shift sort of the... the, the the, it moves the, bodies from, one, from the casino to the... Uh, from the strip uh, to other places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, whether what Las Vegas does, what Nevada does with the taxation of it, that, or Las Vegas in particular because it's its own county uh, in that, uh, that will determine in large measure you know, how successful that operation is. If they make it impossible to open a shop, uh, and they don't seem to, I guess the cost could be about $5,000 a year to run a thousand square foot operation. Uh, a lounge, a, a pot lounge, that's not a lot of money. And so uh, seemingly Las Vegas is saying, yeah, I think we, I think we want to try this. It'll be interesting to see how, where that ends up. Uh, the uh, Democratic uh, uh, presidential candidate field is about 23, 30, I, I, a whole lot of candidates, the most recent being Bill de Blasio, the uh, anti-property uh, guy from uh, Mayor of New York. Uh, but the, well, he's, the, also, the, he's also a, a devout racist. Among other things. Yeah. Uh, but the interesting one to me uh, is the person who has gotten sort of a quasi-endorsement from, of all people, uh, former libertarian candidate Ron Paul. And uh, that's uh, Tulsi Gabbard, who is a representative from the state of Hawaii. She is of uh, Asian or, uh, uh, Oceania, uh, uh, Guam, or someplace like that, heritage. She's a uh, heritage of, uh, you know, some island in the Pacific. And uh, she is somebody who has been vocal for years against the foreign wars, whether it's in uh, Syria, whether it's in Iraq, whether it's in 
you name it, if there's a foreign war, she has been right up there with Ron Paul in opposing those wars. Uh, she's also, uh, very unusually for a Democrat, she's pro-life and she's uh, uh, less of a uh, uh, person to, uh, to, to go after Facebook and Twitter and the rest of those uh, organizations on free speech violations or, or to, to you know, try to impose uh, governmental, uh, governmentally imposed free speech or, or, uh, uh, regulations. Uh, predictably, the Daily Cause hates her, Ron Paul likes her, what do we think? John? Well, I'm, um, she's, she's in favor of, of the, the program and expanding the program that's bankrupting the country, Medicare for All. So All of the that's, Democrats that, that's are on board scary. with that, um, so rhetorically at least. On the rest of the stuff, you know, I, I think the idea that, that any political candidate anymore is going to be 100% in, in alignment with, um, you know, what, what we see as, as ideals for liberty is, you know, I, th I think that's kind of a fool's gold. I think uh, um, if, if she um, runs on this kind of platform, you know, anti-war, uh, pro-free speech, or at least Pro fewer restrictions on free speech. Um, you said she's pro. She's pro life. Yeah. Okay. And uh, does the the Medicare for all? She should be president because she's basically checked the box of uh, litmus test issues for probably ninety percent of the population in the United States. So um, you know, pro life will get. Um, you know, if it push comes to shove a at the end, and and uh, the Republicans think that they're, um, you know, they're, they're going to lose the presidency. What's the most important issue for many people who are of conservative Republicans is pro-life. Um, the uh, you know anti-war um, doctrine will will get a, a hippie uh, segment, uh, and then also basically anybody that's ever sent one of their kids or gone to war themselves. And, you know, free speech is um, the reaction to the political correctness and, and uh, the hate speech and um, the thought control and shouting down people. I think it's a, uh, it's a brilliant platform to put together. Um, It'll be interesting to see whether or not she gets any media traction. So well, far, and not, so, so, far not so much. Well, the, the guy that's getting all the media traction is the, uh, what do I call it? what is the guy with the big smile and no brain, uh, who thinks he's the most charming man in the room, former vice president. You know, he's raising money hand over fist. Um, well, uh, Uncle Joe Biden has got the name recognition. Yeah. The creepy yeah. uncle. But, uh, and, but that's about all he's got. I don't creepy think, uncle. Uh, I don't, yeah. I don't well, think. Well, he thinks he's the most charming man in the room. Yeah, so. he may be. Yeah in that room at least. That's the show for this week. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much for being part of the uh, most recent show. We'll see you again next week. Well, thank you, Richard. Thoroughly enjoyed.